Sri Ishapanishad, translated with commentaries by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Mantra 8 Saparyagat Chakram Akayam Afranam Asnaviram Sudam Apapavidham Kavir Manasi Parabhu Swayambur Yatat Tatyato Ritan Vyadatat Jaswati Bia Samabhya Translation Such a person must know, in fact, the greatest of all, who is unembodied, omniscient, beyond reproach, without veins, pure and uncontaminate, the self-sufficient philosopher who is awarding everyone's desire since time immemorial. Purport here is the description of the transcendental and eternal form of the Absolute Personality of Godhead. The Supreme Lord is not formless. He has his own transcendental form, which is not at all similar to those of the mundane world. The living entities in this world have their forms embodied by the material nature and they work like any material machines. The physiological and anatomical structure of the body of a living being must have a mechanical construction with veins and so forth in the embodiment. But in the transcendental body of the Lord, there is nothing like veins. It is clearly stated here that he is unembodied. That means that there is no difference between his body and soul, nor does he accept the body by the law of nature as we do. In the material concept of bodily life, the soul is different from the gross embodiment and subtle mind. The Supreme Lord is apart from any such compartmentalized arrangement, however, there is nothing like a difference of body and mind in the Supreme Lord. He is the complete whole, and his mind and body and he himself are all one and the same. In the Brahma Sanhita, there is a similar description of the body of the Supreme Lord. He is described there as the Sat Chit Ananda Vigraha. This means that he is the eternal form fully representing transcendental existence, knowledge, and bliss. The Vedic literature states clearly that he has a completely different kind of transcendental body, and thus he is sometimes described as formless. This formlessness means that he has no form like ours, or that he is devoid of a form which we can perceive. In the Brahma Sanhita, it is further said that the Lord can do anything and everything with any one of the parts of his body. It is said there that with each and every one of the parts of his body, such as the hand, he can do the work of the other senses. This means that the Lord can walk with his hands. He can accept a thing by his legs. He can see by his hands and feet, and he can eat by his eyes. In the Shruti Mantras, it is said that he has no hands and no legs, like us, but he has a different type of hand and leg by which he can accept all we offer him and walk faster than anyone anywhere. These things are confirmed in this mantra of Sri Shopanishad by the use of words like omnipotent. The Lord's Sri Vigraha, his worshipful form, which is installed in the temples by authorized acharyas who have realized the Lord in terms of Mantra 7, is also non-different from the original form of the Lord. The original form of the Lord is that of Sri Krishna. Sri Krishna expands himself by an unlimited number of forms like Baladev, Rama, Shinga, 
Varaha, etc. And all of these are one and the same personality of Godhead. Similarly, the Archavigraha, which is worshipped in the temples, is also an expanded form of the Lord. By worshipping the Archavigraha of the Lord, one can at once approach the Lord, who accepts the service of the devotee by his omnipotent energy without any reproach. The Vigraha of the Lord descends by request of the Acharyas, the holy teachers, and works exactly in the original way by his omnipotent energy. Foolish people who have no knowledge of these mantras of Sri Shrapanishad or of any other Shruti mantras consider that the Sri Vigraha, who is worshipped by the pure devotees, is made of material elements. To the imperfect eyes of the foolish people, or to the Kanista Adhikaris, this form is considered material. But such people with little knowledge do not know that the Lord, being omnipotent and omniscient, can transform matter into spirit, and spirit into matter, as he desires. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord regrets the fallen condition of men with little knowledge, who regard the body of the Lord as material because he descends like a man into this world. Such poorly informed persons do not know the omnipotence of the Lord. To the mental speculators, therefore, the Lord does not manifest himself in fullness. He can be appreciated only in proportion to one surrender to him, and the fallen condition of the living entities is due entirely to forgetfulness of our relationship with God. In this mantra, as well as in many others in the Vedas, it is clearly mentioned, from time immemorial, the Lord is supplying. The living being first of all desires, and then the Lord supplies the object of desire, in proportion to the degree of qualification. If a man wants to be a high court judge, he must not only have acquired the necessary qualifications, but he must also depend upon the disposition of the authority concerned who can award the title of high court judge. Simple acquisition of the qualifications of a high court judge is not sufficient in order to occupy the post. This must be awarded by some superior authority. Similarly, the Lord awards enjoyment to the living being in proportion to his qualifications, in other words, by the law of karma. Those qualifications, however, are not sufficient without the mercy of the Lord. Ordinarily, the living being does not know what to ask for from the Lord or what post to qualify himself for. When the living being knows his constitutional position, however, he asks to be accepted into the transcendental association of the Lord in order to render transcendental loving service unto him. Instead of asking for this, the living being under the influence of material nature asks for many other things, and his mentality is described in the Bhagavad Gita as divided or splayed intelligence. Spiritual intelligence is one, but the opposite number is of many varieties. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said that persons who are captivated by the temporary beauties of the external energy, forget their real aim of life, which is to go back to Godhead. Forgetting this, one tries to adjust things by various plans and programs, which are compared with the process of chewing already chewed refuse. But the Lord is so kind that he allows the forgetful living being to do so without interfering in his activities. If a living being wants to go to hell, the Lord allows him to do so without interference. And if he wants to go back home, back to Godhead, the Lord also helps him to do that. 
God is described here as Parabu, the greatest of all. No one is greater than or equal to him. Other living beings are described here as beggars who ask from the Lord, and the Lord supplies their desirables. If other entities were equal to the Lord in potency, or if they were omnipotent or omniscient, there would be no question of begging from the Lord, even for so-called liberation. The real liberation of the living being is to go back to Godhead. Otherwise, liberation as conceived by the impersonalist remains a myth, and the begging business for sense gratification has to continue eternally, unless the beggar comes to his senses and realizes his constitutional position. The Supreme Lord is self-sufficient. When Lord Krishna appeared on earth 5,000 years ago, he displayed the full manifestation of Godhead by his various activities. In his childhood, he killed many powerful demons, and there was no question of acquiring such power by an extraneous endeavor. He lifted Govardhan Hill without any practice of weightlifting. He danced with the gopis without any social restriction and without any reproach. Although the gopis approached him with feelings of amorous love, the mixing of the gopis and Lord Krishna has been worshipped even by Lord Chaitanya, who was a strict sannyasin and rigid follower of disciplinary regulations. To confirm this, Sri Shupanishad says that he is antiseptic and prophylactic, pure and uncontaminant. He is antiseptic in the sense that even an impure thing in the estimation of the mundane world can be purified just by touching him. The word prophylactic refers to his association and is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. There it is said that a scrupulous devotee may appear in the beginning to be Durachara, not well behaved. Yet he is still to be accepted as pure because he is on the right path. That is the prophylactic nature of the Lord's association. The Lord is a papavidam, that is, nothing like sin can touch him. Even if he may do something which appears to be sinful, such actions are all good, and there is no question of the Lord's being affected by sin. In all circumstances, he is sudam, most purified, often compared to the sun. The sun extracts moisture from many untouchable places of the earth, and itself remains pure. In fact, it purifies obnoxious things by its sterilizing effect. If the sun is so powerful, although only a material object, we can imagine the purity and strength of the all-powerful Lord. 